we're well over 100 deaths. We're, we're well in, in these fires. And so I guess I, I will tell you, I was uh, uh, perplexed and um, uh, kind of surprised that, that, I, uh, that the rulemaking process around SB 901 started in January. Um, uh, I, I, I know that by law uh, that... Uh, no, we, we actually we took, we started working on components of it immediately after adoption. Some of it we prepared for in advance. Well, I believe the, I believe the announcement you're meeting was that it was that, that you were beginning an 18-month rulemaking process. Did I, did, am I, is I mistaken on that? We are acting on separate pieces. So the, I think the one you may be referring to is the, the methodology for doing the stress test. At the, that's not, that's not the, the other components. We've moved ahead on implementing the new wildfire requirements. We've moved ahead on the biomass. We're going to vote on that tomorrow. Uh, we've done a lot of the other specific requirements. I can, I can turn to staff for more. But that's, that's only the one piece. We broke it up so that we could move quickly. Well, and then I guess that that communication that isn't that isn't clear to us here. So, so way we interpreted it was that the rulemaking process was going to be began. And it was going to be an 18 month process. And so it was like for me, it was like okay, so where's the urgency here? So I'm I'm actually happy. I'm happy to hear that the the fire plans are going. Forward. I will tell you that this next proceeding, however, there are going to be a number of parties who are loaded for bear because unless we do this carefully and appropriately, then ratepayers could be disadvantaged. Well, I would say that you know, great. That, that I appreciate. I totally appreciate that. Um, but as I said before, uh, dead people, people who die in these fires, are pretty disadvantaged too. I agree. Uh, and so, so when I look at when I look forward to this year, and a wildfire season will probably start in April. What have you done, and what will you do to help protect the safety of the uh, of of the services and the people who who live in 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 our communities? What will you do this year to protect Californians? So <clears throat> I'll go back to the work that we've done in terms of warning, trying to understand why warnings failed, how do we actually improve that, what information needs to come to, to, to local governments, what needs to come from the warning centers, how do we improve the, the, uh, um, the telephone company services to, to folks? This is not an easy question because, again, they, what they tell us is that because we don't have regulatory authority, their efforts are are voluntary, and that's exactly what you find in the response to Sonoma County, in terms of their questions and their their efforts to try to improve the warning system. There, um, we're struggling with that, but we've been struggling with this since uh, since earlier this year. And we're just using our processes to really build the case that in a regulate in a in a formal way that that we're not meeting needs. We have taken the steps that you required to ensure that the new wildfire mitigation plans meet the standards that you defined in the NSB um, 901. We actually have required those elements to be in the plans that they filed with us, which we plan to adopt shortly. We have taken steps to actually uh, bring more staff on to look at new con uh, construction. I can, I can ask Elisa Veta Malashenko, our safety and enforcement director, to talk about that. I can point to the, to the work we did in terms of trying to meet the requirements of the legislature in, in terms of biomass facilities, I can, can, which we're going to vote on tomorrow. I can point to um, um, the fact that we are moving ahead on the, the um, the, the, this question of securitization of the liability, but that is between the utility and us as the people who actually uh, require the utilities to not gouge ratepayers. That is not something that is going to directly affect the interests of those people who've been hurt, whose families have died, whose properties have been destroyed in fires. I have to also point out that because I am a regulator who will take action on pr stuff that's brought to us in formal proceedings, I am still waiting because I cannot prejudge anything that I have heard outside of our proceedings, what took place in the campfire. I know that you were up there. I have also visited. I appreciate the service that you did for California by going there. Uh, I appreciate it very deeply. 
but my role as a regulator requires me not to prejudge the car fire. Right. We are continuing to refine this question of de-energization. It's a challenge. We saw that it took seven years in San Diego. We know that there's value. How do you expedite that? What can we learn from what people did in San Diego? But how do you do that in a way that doesn't create stress on the services that firefighters and other emergency responders need by over um, de-energizing or by de-energizing for too long? When you de-energize a circuit, you have to go look at every f pole and every foot of the wires to make sure that none of them are down or damaged when you turn them back on. That means that the fastest you're going to get back in service is 36 hours. What does that mean for a busy intersection in a community where um, they need to have a traffic light if it's out for 36 hours while people are going to visit and look at some of the, the services? It takes time to really make this kind of a change. We know that it's required. But we want to do this responsibly. I said elsewhere that we are rebuilding the plane while it's in flight. You've got to do that real carefully because if you crash it, it doesn't work for the for rate payers or the, or the public. Well, I, I still, I, what assurance do I give my constituents that it's going to be, that, that things are going to be safer this year? You know, the, to be honest with you, if I was going to give them an answer, I'd say we could cut off all electricity to people who live in fire hazard areas, but that's not going to do it. I don't think that we are prepared in any way here in the state of California for the enormity of what we're seeing. So I'll give you the example of the, of the car fire. 46 miles overnight caused by a fire at, uh, a car, from a car dragging an axle. 46 miles, a three mile high cloud. I can't, my, I, when I say I'm not prepared, I can't wrap my head around that. I can't, that's what I mean by not prepared. There are many things that we are doing I think we will continue to discover there are more things that we need to do. I think we need to get better at what we normally do, the inspections, and I think that's why we're bringing more people on. But I gotta say, we have to do a lot of things that we've never done before. And so I've listed some of them. Are there tools that we can give you to help move some of this along? Because there's an urgency about you know, in this, and you know, I, I hear what you're saying. I understand some of it is, but is some I of just, it I think is concentrating on where we think the risk is highest, rather than treating all pieces of the system. I think a lot of people want to know that they are getting that extra attention, but I think it's how do we actually use the resources we've got in places where the biggest risk is. I'm going to ask if uh, if Lisa has anything she wants to contribute. I just think that climate change happened faster than I ever expected. We saw what was going on in San Diego. We needed to do it s statewide. But the strength and the ferocity of the fires we saw in Northern California, where we've never in encountered those kinds of intense winds in very specific locations, has actually startled me. And I, 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 I'm giving it everything I've got, but I will just say that I'm looking forward to hearing more from other state agencies on things they think are helpful. I'm looking for fresh eyes on this from the new governor. I think w if part of my answer is I have to work with them because I, if you're just looking at me to stop these other fires, to be able to control the ferocity of the winds, I don't know that I can do all that. That that wasn't that that wasn't what I was asking. Okay. I'm, I'm asking, you know, what what do you need for tools to help move this along? Um, thank you very much for the opportunity. I'm Elizaveta Malashenko, Deputy Executive Director for Safety and Enforcement with the Commission, and um, I'd like to just say a few things. Um, one, the interaction between trees and wires is nothing new. It happens all across the country. It's been happening as long as we've had trees and we've had wires. That is not what's driving the wildfire crisis that we have in California here. The, what's driving the crisis is the conditions surrounding um, the wires and the trees that then lead to massive wildfires. And I, I think that's a very important context here because nothing dramatically different happened in the last two years about utility infrastructure or trees. Um, and so if we exclusively just keep focusing 
on clearances and um, traditional methods. We are not going to make leaps and bounds progress that we need. This is a very complicated, multifaceted um, issue that has a lot of components to it, climate change being one of them. And in terms of tools that I needed, um, I think we really need to be gathering um, experts from across of these different domains and best innovative thinkers in this space and um, and having a um, an effort to have an action plan that is not just focused on one uh, component of it. That is part of what I'm trying to do with the Wildfire Technology Innovation Summit, is to bring experts from across the world, from, from Australia, from Canada, from other states who specialize in fire weather, who specialize in vegetation management, understanding fuels behavior, um, uh, different ignition prevention methods, and hear what are the absolute best, most innovative ideas, something we haven't tried before, before. And so in terms of help, I think, you know, anybody who can help um, really uh, put some meat behind this effort, uh, together best minds from academia, from research, scientists, uh, technology companies, fire experts, and utility experts, and have them develop comprehensive proposals that then can be implemented across the different agencies at the state, federal, and local levels. I think that's how we really make leaps and bounds of progress, because as long as we just keep trying to push on one element of this, it's not going to make a dramatic difference in the kind of time that we all uh, would like to see it. Thank you. One, one final, just a follow-up question. And I, I, We'd love to have you join us at our fire wild tech, uh, <laughs> our wildfire tech uh, uh, conference because I think this you've asked the question that we're asking ourselves. We know there are lots of things we can do and should do, and we're doing a lot of them. I just don't know that they're that that from my perspective. That's why I think it's important that the governor is convening the other state agencies, some of whom have better information and better experience in terms of fire than we do. Well, uh, to to you might have, uh, we just have to. I'll move on. Okay. Just you might consider uh, the country of Chile, who has a national emergency alert system, which we found out about while we were there. Um, so I don't know how they've done it. Uh, the, the, but they have figured out a way to pinpoint who they want to notify at a national scale. So if they can do it that way, we should be able to do that in California. Um, the final, the final thing, and I, th and I, I do thank you, Mr. Chair, and I apologize for today, um, is the um, I, my, one of my concerns. I've heard you mention over and over, and talking about rate payers and concerned about rate payers and so on. Um, as we go to implement these fire plans, um, that will be borne on the backs of rate payers. But at what point, where is it, you know, you were weighing safety versus rate payers. Uh, you know, I would hope we could err on the side of safety, uh, recognizing that there are challenges here. We tend to, as, as commissioners, focus on safety, but we also have to recognize that that there are those folks who, who speak to in, in our proceedings who have valid points. So we try to balance that. And that, that comes to this question of reasonableness. What can we reasonably do that's going to create safety without unreasonably increasing costs? So I think that, that on balance, we have done a lot more in terms of safety than we did in, in previous years. Um, I, I think that I've been focused on that personally since I got to the CPUC, but I also I also think that there are other things where we are probably going to be very strong on this question, and that has a lot to do with what the utility does in 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 advance of and during bankruptcy to be able to recover. We think there are things that that we need to do. We need to allow and speak to that allow them become financeable because without money, they're not going to be able to do these things. But I also think that we don't want to make unwise decisions that disadvantage ratepayers there.